or other countries for that matter. So this morning, I'm going to share the message and we welcome those from Inverness. So it's, um, I can't see you, but you can see me. So we welcome you this morning and I hope your hearts are open to receive um, the Word of God this morning. I'm going to be talking about the essentials for successful service. The essentials for successful service. Ministry. Because we want to have, do we want to be successful for God? I know there are a lot of books out there and they give you the seven steps to be successful. Have a, the right prayer team. Align your ministry and calling and set your budgets. Establish your timeline. But there's nothing like going into the Word of God rather than going to these other books. Because God's Word is true. What have we discovered as we've been looking at Malachi? His name means my messenger. It's the very last book of the Old Testament. He is the very last prophet to speak from the Old Testament. The background as we've gone over is simply this. The people had gone into captivity in 586 BC. They had returned in 538 BC, but they kind of neglected the things of God. So God sent along these great prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. And Zechariah's ministry lasts right up to 480 BC. But not only that, God sent Ezra. Ezra came around about 458 BC and he encouraged the people regarding the Word of God. He taught the people the Word of God. And Nehemiah came, a civic leader. He made sure the, wall, the walls around Jerusalem were built, they were secure. That was about 444 BC. And he actually served as a, in a second term as the governor of, of that area in 430 BC. So there's a lot of history behind it. It is a historical book. And so the style of Malachi, it's plain, it's straightforward. Lots of questions are being asked. Um, we see those. I believe there's about 27 questions that are asked in this book. Different from Zechariah who presents all these wonderful visions. But what we see is there is no love for God. Their love for God had grown cold. Their worship had become corrupted. And it had happened within the priesthood. Therefore, because they had lost sight of God's love, they had, they had no real desire to praise and worship Him. In fact, they even asked a question, and, and that was in chapter 1, verses 2. How have you loved us? And then God sets out and proves how He had loved them. The, the kingdom of Edom had been destroyed, but yet they had gone into captivity. God had brought them back. God had favored them. God had blessed them. And he proves how he had loved them. How have we despised your name? They had not honored God like a son would honor the father. That was in verse 6 in chapter 1. They had not honored God like a servant would honor his master. And then they ask another question in chapter 1, verses 7. How have we polluted your altar? And so they had brought these offerings. They had brought in the lame, the, the blind, the sick, the absolute worst. They had brought and offered it to God. And God is saying, I am a great God. Don't insult me. And so we get a picture of what is going on. And so Malachi has exposed the corruption that was going on in the worship. And here he addresses the priesthood's behavior, the men of God, the people that were there to set the example. And, and, and so he's telling them, this is the situation. In fact, the Lord cannot let the situ situation continue the way it's going. He has to intervene and speak and say something. The law had outlined God's plan for holy living. And today, the church has become very similar to what the world is like. People cannot see the difference. But God has given us the instructions on how to live a holy life. And people don't like to talk about holiness anymore. And yet the people had not listened to God. In fact, these priests needed to know that they were violating God's covenant. So Malachi, like the prophets before him, 
share a very heavy message. It's a message that is condemning their behavior. Now, in this passage, God reminded Judah that he had promised to bless them if they were obedient. And if you want God to bless you, you need to listen to what he is saying. You need to do what he asks of you. However, this message it would not be popular among the people, but it was needed. And sometimes the message, the word of God that comes forth might not be popular, but it still has to be shared. After all, an immoral ministry will lead people astray. And church leaders can be guilty of that. If they had only chosen to live by God's word, they would have known life. They would have known peace and righteousness. So I want to look this, at this morning is three essentials for successful worship, for successful service, for successful ministry. Because if we want to be successful, we need to listen to what God's word is saying. So the first essential was their commandment. And we see that in chapter 2. Here we are, we're in the book of Malachi, and we're looking at the second chapter, and we see what the second chapter has to say. And the first essential was the commandment. And what we have in verse, we have this in verses 1 and 2. Can you imagine a world where there are no rules? Can you imagine a football match that has no rules. It's bad enough now that it does have rules. There's still disputes. But one, where there was no rules. Can you imagine going to school and there was no rules and regulations? Can you imagine driving on the road if there's no rules and regulations? But we serve a God. And he is a God of order. He's not a God of chaos. He's a God of order. And so he gives us commandments. In fact, those commandments were there to show that his people are a holy people. His people are set apart. They are different from the world. And so the laws, the commandments of God reveals who God is. So as we look at this first essential was their commandment. Let me read verses 1 for you. And it says this, And now, O priests, this commandment is for you. Do you know that Jesus is also given us commandments? Jesus said in John 15, 17, These things I command you that you love one another. What a powerful commandment. There's 613 laws in the Old Testament, but everything can be sum summarized into loving God and loving our fellow man. So we see the priesthood here. The language here has the same tone as the pre-exile judgments by other prophets. What has happened is the priests had become backslidden. It was apparent when you read, if you read chapter 1, it's, it's very clear this is the case. In fact, the inner spiritual life of the people should have been nurtured by the priests. And we, the believers, we, the people of God, should be encouraging one another, ministering to one another. Therefore, there can be no mitigation of the punishment about to be pronounced on them. After all, this commandment or admonishment is there to rebuke a people who were disregarding the word of God. Of course, there's always a process when God speaks. God is a God of mercy. God is a God of love and compassion. And so this, here we have this self-fulfilling word that comes from God. It may be that this command refers to the curses in the law, and we'll look at a little bit at that later, that will happen to them. If they do not take these warnings to heart, a curse from the law would come upon them. After all, during the time of Haggai, they were neglecting the house of the Lord. They were looking after their, their own affairs, which became more important than the things of God. And so they had become impoverished until they got their priorities right and went back to serving God. And so the priesthood has been divinely ordained. They were required to be faithful. We are all required to be faithful. Therefore, this threat or this announcement is part of the process in God trying to show them mercy. But it's important as we get to verses 2. We look at verses 2 
And we need to ponder, think upon what God is saying. Verse 2 says, If you will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already because you do not take it to heart. Quite strong language here. Their disobedience, God is saying, would bring judgment. And if you look at the Old Testament, you look at the book of Deuteronomy, you get in chapter 28, you get a list of the, the blessings and, and the curses there. But it's one thing to hear, but it's another thing to hearken and obey what you have heard. Deuteronomy 28 says this, But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commands, commandments and statutes which I command you today, then all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. <coughs> very, very strong language. But the people of that time, a bit like today, they hear the word of God, but it was as if they were sticking their fingers in their ears rather than pondering and thinking about what God is saying. And it's important to think about what God is saying. Take, for example, this talk, the scripture talks about thou shalt not commit adultery. It's part of the Ten Commandments. Can you imagine if I did that? It would destroy my family, my wife, my home. It would destroy the church. It would destroy all my ministry. And to think about that devastation, that would be horrendous. And it's like any sin, we need to think about what it, the damage it would do. King David was a man after God's own heart and he never pondered and thought about what he would do with Bathsheba and he lost all moral authority to discipline his own children later because his moral authority was damaged. In fact, this teaching was set out for the priests and the law just like the warnings were there. And take it to heart is a phrase very similar to that in Haggai. Haggai says this, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And so we have to consider the, our actions, our ways. And of course, there are promises. They must desire in the heart to be faithful to God and give glory to his name. After all, the priest's behavior fell short of what was satisfactory. Does our behavior fall short? If they fail to keep God's commandments, it's quite clear. It talks about those curses coming upon them. Therefore, the promises of the punishment and the blessings are conditional. And yet a curse is literally, literally all the devastation of God's righteous judgment. And God still judges nations. We know that this is for Israel, but we need to think of what is happening in our own nation. Is God judging our nation for the sins it is committing? Are we being judged? We need to seriously ponder over this, think about this. Yes, there's privileges, and as Christians, we are in a privileged position because God gives us peace and joy and love. He gives us a future. He gives us a hope. Uh, he protects us like he protected me from having a scooter accident. Now, this might talk about the privilege of nullifying the priestly blessing, which we read about in number six. Therefore, this is about the priesthood will lose their privileges and benefits. God has blessed us. But if we start to stray, if we start to wander, then we start to lose some of those blessings that God has blessed us with. We start to lose our peace. We start to lose our joy. And perhaps it could be talking about material um, losses. In fact, God is chastising these people to recall them, to think about him. After all, they, when we think about this, it is quite incredible what God is trying to get across here. So we get verses 1 and 2. It talks about the commandments, that first essential. So if you want to be successful in ministry, then you need to listen to the commands of God and what he is saying. You don't need to pick up a book that tells you about the seven steps to successful ministry. Just read the Bible. But we get a second essential, and the second essential will be their children. 
It's important that we have children because children can carry our work forward. Looking at verses 3 here, we're talking about the second essential will be their children. And it says this, Behold, I will rebuke your descendants. I will spread refuge on your faces, the refuge of your Solomon feasts, and one will take you away with it. Now, we need to remember he's a prophet. And what do prophets do? Prophets, they can talk about what's going to happen in the future. And this is what he's really talking about. When we talk about verses 3 here, it talks about descendants. In the Hebrew, that word can, can mean seed. And that can be used both for physical offspring or for crops. The rebuke, this yet rebuke your seed might talk about their crops being blighted, part of the covenant curses. When you go into Deuteronomy 28, you can see that. But the covenant curses will also affect their children. The fruit of their womb will be cursed. In fact, their, the seed or their children would not be qualified to be part of God's priesthood. And if you look at what happened in 70 AD, go to the time of Christ, what they had done, the priesthood almost disappeared in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. And this is really what this is talking about if you look at it very carefully. Perhaps the implication is that the rebuke of God is so effective they might not have descendants. It's a warning to the priesthood. And this word refuge is repeated twice in the Hebrew language and it's emphasizing what, what it means. The idea here is talking about the intestines of an animal that had been butchered for sacrifice and therefore they would be disgraced with their faces being covered with this, this waste of intestines that included the dung of the animal, it, it included their intestines, the blood and it would be smeared on their faces and it was, it was disgusting and looking at some historical documents that's what the Romans did to some of those priests in 70 AD when the temple was being, going to be destroyed. And it was destroyed. But its main significance is that it would render the priesthood completely unclean and unfit to serve. And that's what happened in 70 AD. The priesthood had come to an end because Christ, the one and true great high priest, stands in for all mankind. And then... We look at the sanctuary, and I will take you away. This means to the place where the, the intestines were, were taken out of the camp, taken away from the temple. They were dumped, and the idea here is giving us a picture, removed from the temple, removed from the sanctuary to the dung heap. And the law required that this type of animal's um, intestines would be removed. In fact, it was to be burned outside the camp of the city, and so what it is describing is the removal of the priests from the temple when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. It's quite interesting how this verse kind of sticks out here. And so their children would no longer continue the priesthood. They would no longer stand in for God because, because of their lifestyle. And in the end, they, these 400 years later, they had Christ crucified on a cross. So we see the commandment. We see what happens with their children when they deviate from the things of God, when they understand the Word of God incorrectly. So we get a third essential, and that is their covenant. Looking at verses 4 and 5. We all know what covenants are. God made covenants with, with different people in the Old Testament. A covenant with Noah, a covenant with, with Abraham, a covenant with Moses and the people of God at Mount Sinai, a covenant with David that he would have someone that would sit on his throne forever. That could only be Jesus Christ. We have a covenant that we even read about in the Old Testament in Jeremiah 31, 31, and it talks about a new covenant which Jesus has sealed with his own precious blood. And so what we see here, let me read verses 4 for you. It says this, Then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. Verses 4. This is about the, Levi, the Levitical priests. This covenant with Levi 
was made at the time when they left Egypt. So we're going back. So we're sort of jumping forward. We're jumping back now. In fact, the covenant with Levi has conditions and it can be, it can be nulled if it's violated. Yet the Old Testament does not provide a formal description of the establishment of this covenant with Levi. The tribe came to prominence during the days of Moses and Aaron, who belonged to it. After all, we have a situation where Moses goes up the mountain. We read about it in Exodus 32. Moses goes up the mountain fasting for 40 days. He gets the Ten Commandments. And as he's up the mountain, the people start to play. They have a mass orgy and they worship this golden calf. And they've gone from God. They have ignored God. And so when Moses comes down, we know that the tablets are smashed because the law has been broken. And Moses says this, you read about this in Exodus 32, 26. Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves to him and they picked up their swords They went into the camp and they killed 3,000 of their brethren. Quite brutal. And yet God is saying this was necessary because if this had not happened, then sin would have got out of control and it had to be dealt with. And it's quite a powerful picture. Moses, one of the meekest men, asking the Levi, the Levi priests to go in and kill their brethren. Quite, quite. But you have to understand what the significance of it all. And so this is about learning. The purpose of judgment is to, cl- to, to declare that they would learn lessons from it. Yet many of us have, have been afflicted before we learn. So when we're afflicted, sometimes we learn lessons, spiritual truths from those afflictions. And God often del- disciplines us not to remove us from our service or our ministry, but to help us remain in it. He has to. But if they had acted properly, then the covenant would continue with all its blessings to be enjoyed. And we want to be blessed by God. However, disobedience would bring the curses and the annulment of the covenant. And then we get to verses 5 and it says this. My covenant was with him, one of life and peace. And I gave them to him that he might fear me. So he feared me and was reverent before my name. My covenant was with him. Of course, it speaks of the Levitical covenant as a thing of the past. Him speaks of the tribe of Levi. And this is a covenant of life, a covenant of peace. There is a covenant of peace. When you read Numbers 25, this is what it says. It says, Phineas the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my back, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel because he was zealous with my zeal among them so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. Therefore say, behold, I give to him my covenant of peace. What's the story behind that? You have a Balaam that tries to bring a curse upon the the people of Israel. But then he comes up, it didn't work. God ended up blessing them. But he he devises another plan. You read about this in the book of Numbers. And so he gets the people to mix with with the, the pagan society around them. And this priest sees sees a, an Israelite with a pagan and he takes a javelin and he puts the javelin through the two of them and kills them. And it's quite shocking what we read in the Old Testament, but it brings peace. It brings, it, brings, it brings an order to the situation. Again, we could discuss this all day, but what he is saying is, if we do not have God, we do not have peace. If we have God and his commandments, we have life. And so life and peace summarize the covenant blessings that will be bestowed by God. But life is not merely about health and length of days, but the total fulfillment of God's favor. And so there are lessons as we kind of come to a a conclusion, an end here. 
God is the fountain of life. And it stretches beyond this world. God gives us everlasting life. You know, the psalmist says in Psalm 36, For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. God is the one that is the fountain of life. And he says in Deuteronomy 12, 2, it says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. This is the Old Testament speaking about what happens at the end, what happens in our life, because we will all die. And yet peace is basically the absence of strife and warfare, but there are lessons about it. This calls for reverence. This is what it's saying. Let me read it, read it again for you. My covenant was with them, one of life and peace, and I gave them to him that he might fear me, so fear me, and was reverent before my name. We need to respect God. In fact, it would be seen in their service to God, like the tribe of Levi showed in the past. But this was a big contrast with their, their disrespectful behavior seen in Malachi's day. So how do we conclude this morning? God gave them a priesthood and a commandment they had to consider very carefully. Malachi denounced those priests who did not lead the people correctly. After all, God could curse their children, so the Levitical priesthood would come to an end, and it did come to an end. Your sons and your daughters will be given to another nation. And that's what Deuteronomy 28, put it where you read the blessings and curses. What does it say in Deuteronomy 28? Your sons and your daughters shall be given to other people, and your eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all day long, and there shall be no strength in your hand. This is what God is saying. God's word always comes to pass. Therefore, the Levitical priesthood had a covenant they shamelessly broke and rejected in the days of Malachi. And today we have church leaders that are doing things that do not, lie, they do not match up with the word of God. They have become more like the world rather than what the word of God is saying. And so the misfortunes they were experienced were not some random accident. When you read the last three chapters of Deuteronomy, God's covenant blessings for Israel were conditional. And it comes into force because the requirements of the covenant have been ignored. Let, let's think about this carefully. Think about this. We have the commandments. And when we look at the curses and the blessings, if you look at the blessings in Deuteronomy, it, it's, it's incredible. It says, if you obey God... You'll be blessed in the city, blessed in the countryside. We live in a time where women are being raped in the street because of this lockdown. Um, th there's been more domestic abuse than at any time. It talks about women being fertile, giving birth to healthy children. It talks about plentiful crops, if you obey God. It talks about the livestock. And, you know, we've been judged over the years. We've had mad cow disease and all kinds of things. It talks about the abundance of bread and grain. And we can see how quickly when people panic, there's a shortage of food with the supermarkets having bare shelves uh, at the beginning of this COVID. Blessings coming in your going out, defeating your enemies, established as a holy people of God, feared by other nations, plentiful rain, you, that, that's, you know, good conditions for the crops. The good conditions. Lending to other nations rather than borrowing. The UK used to be the world banker at one point, but now we're borrowing vast sums, scary sums. Be the head, not the tail. And so we need to, this is what God is saying, these blessings and curses. If we read Deuteronomy 28, study it very carefully but if you disobey, you're going to be cursed in the city, in the country. Your women are going to be infertile. Your crops are going to be destroyed. Your livestock, there's going to be a shortage of food. Your comings and going outs are going to be cursed. You'll be defeated by your enemies, ridiculed by other nations, filled with despair. And it so goes on. And you'll be the tell, afflicted by many diseases. Now, just let me pick out a couple there. When you look at that, curses in Deuteronomy 
It says in verses 59, I believe it is, it says there will be extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues. In fact, the, the BBE Bible, the Bible in basic English, you know, very clear English, is saying that though these plagues would, be, would stretch um, through long years, and we're looking at plagues, this COVID, and you wonder when we look at the judgment of God, you've got to look at what it's saying in Deuteronomy 28. And so God's given us commandments for his people to love one another, not to, dis not to de reject his commandments, because the, these commandments are there for our reason to protect us, the children we looked at, the covenant we have looked at. If you disobey the covenant, you're in trouble. So if you want to have a successful ministry, don't pick up the book of seven steps to successful ministry. Pick up your Bible, read a little passage like this that has five verses and study the scripture carefully because God wants us to be successful. I know we're in difficult times, but God is going to break through. There is a revival that is coming and it has to start in the house of God. When God's people get themselves right, then God is going to move. And this morning, I encourage you, I encourage you with these few verses from the book of Malachi. Take it, study it, and see how God speaks to you. Maybe this is not a message for anyone in this building. Maybe it's not a message for anyone in the church in Inverness. Maybe it's a message for someone that else that is watching online. But take God's word serious. Think about it. And I leave you with these thoughts this morning. And we're going to come as the church in Inverness goes back to their service. We're, go we're